Well, you're listening to another episode of the Zealous Podcast. Welcome back. Each week we have some amazing guests. This week's no exception. We've got Kelly Dormandy. She is the lead strength coach for Loyola Marymount University. She was formerly with the LA Sparks, the WNBA team. We're going to talk about a whole bunch of things covering those and more. I hope you enjoy. Why don't we just kick off with like Loyola Marymount? You're how many how many teams are you overseeing for their strength and conditioning right now? As a department, we oversee 18 teams. I have four staff members, including myself. Personally, I am responsible for about six right now. One third of the sports. And you've got four yes. other people. Yes. Uh-huh. Two of those work? sports are being tag teamed a little bit. Well, we don't have football here. So with that, basketball becomes our priority. Um, so my men's basketball guru, Coach Jay Bird, he's all in with men's basketball. He's traveling to everything. He's the only member of my staff that travels to everything. So I have to make sure that he is readily available and free to give them that time. He also has other teams, um, but it gets sticky in terms of when he's gone and coaches being upset that he's not around consistently. Um, so I've looked at our calendar and some of the teams that may not come in as often over the course of a week um, that I pair those off with him so that we're not stuck covering teams five days a week. And there's more consistency with a strength coach who's regular, readily available year round. So trying how, to keep the peace with everybody. Yeah, I know. He travels with the team. How many other sports get their strength uh, like a strength coach and for that matter, like athletic trainers to travel with them? Are there, is it just pick and choose or how does that work? I'm fairly certain just about all of our teams will travel an athletic trainer. Mm -hmm. um, but from a strength and conditioning standpoint, since I feel as though we need at least one additional staff member to be not understaffed that I've held my ground as far as my staff traveling because it only creates chaos for the one or two individuals that have to stick around and cover a 15 hour day. And once the thing is, is it's a domino effect, right? Once one person travels for one sport, then we're traveling for everything. So until we can be at the threshold of five or six sports performance coaches and provide that travel, that traveling luxury to everybody, I think it's in my best interest to hold off until we can do that to make sure it's as fair as possible. Gotcha. So basketball is the big money sport in L at LMU. So our, what's the hope of uh, road to the final four? How's, how's the basketball team doing right now? I think our men are six and three. Our women are three and four, three and five. Um, both brand new, for the most part, brand new head coach on the women's side. First year head coach came in this year. Um, men's coach is in his second year, whether or not you really count the COVID year. Um, so hopes are high here. I think uh, rebuilding, uh, re in, instating new cultures and so forth, um, getting a lot of new, fresh, hungry talent. So I like what the future holds for both the men's and women's side for LMU women's basketball. Well, that's interesting. So a lot of like when we talk about, especially the professional level of sports, when new coaches come in, they often bring a kind of an army of coaches with them, sometimes including the strength coach, but that's not the case with you and LMU because you've been doing this for a few years now. Uh, what is it like when you get a new coach to come onto campus and, and how do you build that relationship? Because it's, it's something that you've been doing a while, you've got some programming and they may come in with some different ideas. How does that work? I'm very fortunate in that the new hire for women's basketball was somebody that I worked with at USC. She was formerly the assistant coach there on the women's side, and I worked with a women's basketball coach. So the transition for us was rather seamless. She already knew kind of what my coaching philosophy was about, what my training philosophy was about. So she pretty much let me go and do my thing. As far as Jordan on the men's side, uh, it's just gaining an understanding of where that coach is coming from, what their philosophy is, my approach. Uh, personally and with my staff is to listen first, uh, to hear them out, hear what they would like to see in their training program. And then can we meet them halfway if there's any uh, disagreements in terms of uh, coaching or a training philosophy. But right now, 
it looks as though Coach Jaybird has pretty much hit a home run with the men's basketball team, and Coach Stan is incredibly happy with the work that they've done in the weight room and how it's transferring over to the court. Okay, so the other sports that are under your belt, and not necessarily your personal one, but you mentioned 16 sports. Sorry, did, that, did I get that right? 18 sports, and, and you're overseeing six of them. What are the six that you're overseeing and some of the, the remaining sports? What are the, what are the ones that LMU is offering right now? So the five staples that I've had for three and a half years have been baseball, softball, indoor volleyball, beach volleyball, and golf. Those have been the five that I have worked with. Uh, well, also the way I kind of broke up my staff outside of our basketballs was I paired similar like brother, sister sports. So baseball, softball, there's a lot of similarities. Obviously there's some differences, um, but it makes it easier for my staff so that we're not sitting at our desks, guarding our desks all day long when we're also training five or six teams every single day. So we have a men's and women's soccer duo. Uh, we have men's and women's tennis. We have men's and women's water polo. We have women's swimming. We have men's and women's cross country track men's and women's rowing. And I know I'm missing a couple, but that gives you kind of an idea of, of what all we have going on here. Yeah. So for, for the listening audience that are coming up in the ranks of being strength conditioning specialists or strength coaches, maybe they're at high school level, but they want to push it up into the college ranks or beyond. What are the things that are are critical that they need to start really homing in on? What, what kind of things that they are just volunteer at every opportunity, internships? I mean, what are we talking? I mean, obviously you wanna be able to have the knowledge base right from an educational standpoint. Not that it's required to have a master's degree, but I think that's becoming the trend nowadays. Um, so at the end of the day, you gotta know your shit, right? Coaches are gonna test you in terms of, okay, they're gonna question, what you're doing, what you know, they're gonna bring up things that they've seen elsewhere. And more than anything, that's probably more just a test to see if you're able and willing to hold your ground. Obviously you wanna get some practical experience, whether it be internships and so forth. Obviously a lot of those internships are oftentimes unpaid, so it's very difficult. So I would say if you're still in the college world, try to knock that out while you can to get into the real world. Um, but at the end of the day, what I've seen is your ability to build relationships with people is paramount in this industry, whether that's with obviously head coaches, uh, support staff, so athletic trainers, sports medicine and so forth, but most importantly, it's the people you serve and the kids you serve. And at the end of the day, we are providing customer service to an 18 to 21 year old uh, to make them the best that we can in sport, but also better people in life. How does that work, better people in life? I mean, how do you, how do you fold that into a training program? Discipline details, our culture. Our culture is the big thing. When I got here or even when I was interviewed, um, there was a vibe of a country club culture and I am the furthest thing from country club. So uh, <laughs> the goal was to kick country club to the curb immediately. So my first year, uh, I wrote up our ground rules up on a whiteboard. And at the time it was only myself and one other, Coach Jordan, tag teaming our 18 sports. And I got in front of every single sports team, introduced myself, introduced him, and went through the ground rules, standards, and expectations for everybody in this weight room. And it is the same for everybody, whether you are a full scholarship athlete on men's basketball or a walk-on on any one of our number of sports, the ground rules uh, in our weight room and our core values are the same for everybody. And if at any point in time, you don't feel as though you want to follow them or you feel as though you are privileged not to follow them. We have a number of doors that you can exit and you can go hang out at the rec center. So All I think right. it, it really boils down to culture and attitude. Have you ever fired an athlete? Have you ever said, here's the door? Um, I have kicked out a team. Actually, I have this year, this fall, I walked out of a training session and I've never done that in my career. Well, what went on there? What was going on? We were warming up. Fortunately, I was, uh, one of my strength coaches assists me with two of my teams. So we were warming up and it's early morning. I get it, but well, 7 a.m., right? 7 a.m. is not really early. I'm ready for wake, lunch. Yeah, since I wake up at 3.45, not really early, right? So yeah. we're warming up and this wasn't like early on in the semester. We already knew the drill. We knew what the expectations were. We understand that we're supposed to be detailed in everything we do. We understand that we are supposed to be vocal in all that we do. 
and we're warming up through the agility ladders and there were maybe two out of the 14 or 15 players being vocal and they're yelling at their teammates uh, trying to encourage them uh, to wake up right so I gave them a couple attempts and we're going about our business and one of the athletes says, coach, I think we need a love lap. And a love lap is we go outside, we run the loop outside of the parking lot. And within that couple minutes time that it takes to run the loop, you get your mind right. If you're right, come on back into the weight room. If not, just keep going, take the day off. I don't really care because it's your loss, not mine. So I said, all right, take it. So take our love lap. I uh, go over to my assistant and I say, all right, what do you think? Think they're going to come back ready to go? He goes, I have faith, coach. And I said, for whatever reason, I'm not really feeling today. I don't, I don't really feel as though you do. So we'll see. I'm not too confident. So they come back. We go through the program. We're on week four, right? We should know the drill by now. Are there any questions, comments, or concerns? I always ask that at the end. No, coach, we're good. Okay. I had a couple injured players. They had to modify. So in order to see them, and one of our vocal leaders on the team comes over to me and says, Coach, the most, most of the team is doing this, but isn't, aren't we supposed to be doing this? And I said, you're absolutely correct. Why don't you do your teammates a favor and tell them that they're doing the wrong thing and tell them what they're supposed to do? So she does that. Another athlete comes over to me and says, Coach, I don't like the music. Can you change it? And I said, sure thing. Sure thing. I go to turn my music off. And in that moment, I realize, okay, either you're going to lose it or you need to remove yourself from the situation. Thankfully, I removed myself from the situation. So I turned off my phone, I shut off my music, I yelled to my assistant, I said, hey coach, my music isn't a fan favorite today. Why don't you plug in? And I said, on that note, I'm gonna take the day off. And I just kept walking outside and I hear him tell them, no music folks, you've lost the privilege of music. The fact that coach D, just walked out of this weight room after she pretty much gave you three strikes to get your heads out of your asses. We're done for the day. So we're going to train in silence today. And that was that. And I walked up and sat in my office for the hour and let them train. Oh. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's awesome. But it I sent mean, a message because you know yes. what? Within 15 minutes, my phone rang and I did not. I did not call the coach. I didn't tell her. I said, you know what? She's going to know because they're gonna walk in there nervous. I don't even need to say anything. And I don't even care to at this point. I said nothing. I just went about my business, got ready for my next team. I had some meetings, things going on. And sure enough, my phone is blowing up. And it was in the middle of the meeting. So I told, you know, I kind of, I didn't hit ignore, but I let it go to voicemail because I couldn't respond at that moment. And then the phone rang again. And so then in my meeting, I said, I, excuse me, I need to take a second to take this phone call. And she said, on a scale of one to 10, how pissed are you? I said, it's beyond a 10, but you know what? Like I have given everything to your team. And that is one of the most disrespectful things that I've ever experienced in my coaching career. And so I decided to give them a taste of their, their own medicine and walk out. If they can't realize that it's a privilege to have not only one, but two strength coaches helping 15 players, well, then they've lost the privilege. So better luck next time. And so then they got kicked out of practice because of it. Wow. And then, the, and then the culture starts to shift slowly and surely. I didn't have to motherfuck any of them. It was just, okay, you know what? You're right. We'll change the music. But you, we've had three strikes now. I'm good. You guys can keep lifting. I'm going to take a hike. Stop wasting my time. Right on. Yeah. And that's all it takes sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. A little wake up call, a little slap in the face. Yeah. Good for you. Okay. You've, you've brought up the word privilege twice now. And I guess for the listening audience, that's not actually watching the YouTube video portion. You're just audio only. I'm with coach Kelly Dormandy, and she is the lead strength conditioning coach for Loyola Marymount University. And she is a black woman. Now talk about, uh, honestly, it's like, could you stack the cards against you anymore in a male dominated industry? You're like, screw this. Yeah. Okay. You don't get much more minority, do you, in our world? And yet you've risen. How the hell have you done that? I have the trifecta. I'm a gay black female. Oh, so the, the cards are like, Holy I'm set cow. up to fail. I'm set up to fail. 
that's like me going into a some dive bar trying to find a girlfriend or, or or whomever, and I just pour water down my pants and makes me look like I just had a major accident, and now I've got to try and find the hottest person around and walk out the door with them. I'm like, yeah, yeah, that I'm not going to climb that mountain. What what made you climb so high? How did you do this? I guess I love a challenge. Uh, I have my moments where I'm like, really, what did, what did you get yourself into? Um, I've made a lot of sacrifices, whether black, white, male, female in this industry, you have to be willing to make sacrifices. Sure. But at the end of the day, for me, it was the first step was going to grad school. My parents helped me with undergrad and my parents said, you can go to grad school. We encourage you to do so, but that's on you. And so when I put that foot through the door and I took that step in, it was like, okay, I'm all in and I'm going all in to climb to the top or just don't even waste your time now. So from that moment, it got real when I realized I'm taking full financial responsibility for every bit of my college loans. Um, so I had two and a half years at Springfield College. Fortunately, I got a grad graduate assistantship the last year and a half, so I only had to pay for a year. But again, I worked my ass off to earn that privilege um, to be able to have that opportunity. And from there, I told myself, whatever opportunity opens up, regardless of wherever it is in the country, I owe it to myself to take the opportunity. You can't, you can't pick and choose in this industry. Well, I don't want to live there. Well, if it's a great opportunity for my career and it's going to further my development in my career for the next step and the next transition, well, then I need to do it. So I went to South Carolina for a year and then Maryland for a very short stint of six months. Um, and then uh, I was at USC for six years, LMU for three and a half now. And in between the stops of SC and and LMU, I was the head strength coach for the LA Sparks for six years. So for me, it was about being all in, um, being knowledgeable, having a great deal of experience. I believe in having as many tools in your toolbox as possible. I have programmed for probably at least a dozen different teams. And I think that makes me a viable candidate when opportunities present themselves. So whether it's male or female teams, I've programmed the vast majority. Um, I have not yet gotten into the football side, although I have had discussions and interviews uh, with people. But um, yeah, I, you, you've got to be willing to make sacrifices. You got to love it. The hours can be ruthless. And uh, you got to you got to do it for the right reasons. And the right reasons aren't selfish reasons, but it's about the kids. That's cool. Well, and at no point in time have you mentioned the word luck because that has nothing really to do with it. You create your own opportunities through hard work and devotion. And yeah, taking it when whatever door opens up. Tell me about USC. Uh, now, that's University of South Carolina, is that, or University of Southern California? Which one are we talking? South Carolina was my very first stop, and then Southern okay. California was my six year stop. Ah. So, so I've, been, I've been to both. We won't debate okay. right now which one's the real USC. Oh, dang. No, no, I wouldn't go there. <laughs> no, no. We can each have one coast on the other. And speaking of coasts, you know, I was I was just north of where you went to school at Springfield. I was UMass Amherst. There's, And I, I know I'm obviously biased by growing up in the Northeast, you being in Connecticut, me in Massachusetts. But I truly believe, Coach, that there is a an ingrained cultural work ethic that is much stronger in that region of the country than, let's say, uh, where we are now out in California. And that's not to belittle or demean anyone out here on the West Coast because it, that's just a generalization basically. But I find that when the weather is really nice, there is less, there is less concentration of work ethic in that region. What would you say to that? I agree with you 100%. Yeah, I think uh, the sense of urgency isn't the same when it's, 70 and, and sunny year round. Or maybe it's the fact that half of the year on the East Coast, it's either raining or snowing. So what else is there to do than to grind and put your head in a book and go to the library and, and be the best that you possibly can at your craft? Yeah. But I'm with you. I'm with you 100%. It's a, yeah. it's a different culture. I think I pride myself on being very blue collar. I've been in the industry now at the division one level for I believe 11 years and I love my staff to death, but I set an example by outworking my staff. And there, some of them are first year strength coaches. 
but I think it, it is ingrained in me and who I am and how I was raised and where I came from. And that's the East coast. Yeah. Uh, I would have to agree. Blue collar neighborhood myself. I think I'm one of the first in the family, extended family to go to college. Everyone else is in a, a trade of some sort. So yeah, definitely it, it, it promotes a certain kind of behavior. I think we would wake up within a half an hour of one another, you know, and, uh, and when our feet hit the ground, you just go for it. So I'm interested in the sparks though. WNBA, you went from college to pros and back to college. So before we talk about that transition back and forth, how was it training with the sparks? It was awesome. Different level and caliber of athlete. It is very different though than training a college athlete. How so? And I had to learn that. As a college strength coach, there's, it's more about discipline, details, kind of my way or the highway for the most part. Uh, in the professional world, that's not going to work, especially when you're working with some of the greatest of all time in terms of Candace Parker, Neko Gumake, Chelsea Gray, and the list goes on. Um, so they've been at levels in, as far as gold medalists and Olympians that I haven't tr played at, let alone trained at. Um, so you have to be very open and receptive to, to their needs and their wants. At the end of the day, they're grown ass women. They've made it through the college ranks. Some of them now have played in the WNBA. I think Candace is like in her 13th or 14th year now. So at the time, probably around 10 years. And she was playing double seasons overseas and then another WNBA season stateside. So every year she's playing two seasons and she did that for somewhere between 10 and 12 years in a row, right? So if anybody knows her body, it's her. So when you're first trying to build that relationship, it's having the conversation with each player on an individual level of, hey, talk to me. What has worked for you? What things maybe haven't worked? Help me understand what you're going through what things bother your body um, and just listening and being open and receptive and then taking what they feel they need and they want in their program and adding it in, but then also slowly but surely implementing some other strategies to complement what they want and they need. So for example, you know, Candace has had knee injuries over the course of her career, um, more so in college and so forth. Um, so Obviously for her, her lower body strength and making sure she's strong enough around her quads and, and so forth uh, to prevent any further knee injuries. And I understood what she wanted and what she felt she needed. And we did all of that, but then educating her on, okay, well, if we're inducing a great deal of quad strength, but we're neglecting the posterior chain in your hamstrings, well, then we might not be balancing your body as best we can. So hear me out on this. Can we complement and pair your quad exercise and get hamstrings? Because I'd hate to see you get so quad over dominant that we're actually inducing more stress at that knee. And then perhaps, not definitively, but maybe we increase your risk for even more knee injuries or issues down the road. And so then once you educate them and give them the, the why factor, the professional athlete really wants to know why. Why are you asking me to do this? How is it going to help me? And how is it going to help me be a better player? Because at the end of the day, they're there to be a great player, but it also pays their bills. So we start talking about, yeah, you have the scholarship uh, on the collegiate side, but the professional athlete is trying to provide for their family, put a roof over their head, their kids' heads, uh, get meals, so on and so forth. So that contract is really important to them. So it becomes more of a business relationship at the professional world, and you better be prepared to be able to help position that athlete to see great success personally on an individual level, but also on a team and collective level. It, it, it can be cutthroat. Yeah, I bet. So where did you, where did you go to keep up with the Joneses in terms of information, education, outside of the degrees, outside of the, the classes that you took through your master's and, and for that matter, undergrad, like where do you go for more information about strength conditioning? You know, in my time at USC and with the Sparks, we had some great PTs. And so I realized like, okay, strength movements are strength movements, right? We all kind of know bilateral push versus hip dominant pulls, knee dominant pulls, planes of movement. Okay, great. Um, strength is strength, but at the end of the day, 
can I put my athletes in a position where I'm truly lowering injury risk and who better to seek out information from than our sports medicine team and our physical therapists. Um, so we had some great PTs at USC and then Dr. Courtney Watson, who's the head uh, athletic trainer for the LA Sparks. And she's kind of the head director of performance and she's been with the Sparks uh, probably for 10 plus years. Um, she is a mind like none other. So we were a fantastic tag team and I would kind of run things by her and then ask for her opinion or are there any things from your side of the side of the scope that I can put in as preventative measures to couple and pair with our strength training. So I think once you're willing to get outside the nuts and bolts of true meathead strength training, um, I think you'll see that your athletes will reap more rewards and benefits in the long time, in the long term. And I'm not saying not to squat, not to deadlift, not to bench, not to do all those things. But at the end of the day, especially at the professional world, it's a matter of managing their bodies um, and making sure that they can sustain the intensity of practice and games and the duration of a season that might only be five months long, but they're playing three games a week. That's what it boils down to is the longevity of, can I have this player playing in game one and game 35 or 40, even though there might only be three months separating from game one until we hit the championship season. So of the meathead kind of programming and, and movements, what, what movements have you relinquished or minimized in the programs on, in general? I will say this in the WNBA in my six years, I did not program any Olympic lifts or any barbell movements. Only a couple athletes did them per request. And though that off more often than not were athletes who weren't getting as much playing time as they probably had hoped they would. So they wanted to train a little bit harder. Um, but for the most part, our training was more, dare I say, functional in nature with dumbbells and kettlebells and more movement specific. Uh, more conditioning based than it was a matter of trying to gain strength. Now in the college world, uh, I'm not married to everything, but when, for example, I have a baseball team in which the vast majority of the team is trying to gain weight, there's something to be said for, we need to have some phases where we're doing barbell back squats and trap bar deadlifts. But I will say this, our very first week and phase, we did barbell only five second isometric holds in the hole. And by the end of our session, uh, there wasn't much talking, a whole lot of sweating and uh, people were very sore in the weeks to come. So it's, it's very important to me that we build the appropriate foundation, even if it's just with body weight or unloaded bars before we're going to progress. If there's any one thing that I learned from core performance and athletes performance, it is that it is not in your best interest to load dysfunction. So we're going to see how well our movement, our athletes move early on. And if there's certain people that can't progress at the same rate as the rest of the team, well, so what, right? We just educate that athlete as to why we're easing them in a little bit more slowly and why we're trying to do what we're trying to do to put them in the best and safest position possible to reap benefits later. If we start too quickly and overload too quickly, I don't want to risk an injury and then just have to have a setback and start over again anyway. Yeah, it makes sense. So, did so you I love it all, but I'm not married to sure. it all. I think it really just depends on the sport, but more particularly, it depends on the athlete too. Well, and so uh, the the barbell lifts. Was there any correlation between non contact injuries? For did you notice anything like that compared to the functional programming that you did? Was there or performance? Did you notice any difference between those types of programs? I believe in my six years with the LA Sparks, I think there was one ACL injury and it came from a player who got off of a plane after playing overseas um, and probably didn't have enough rest before going into a game. I think that was the only ACL injury. I will also note that in three years at USC with women's soccer, we also did not do any Olympic lifting. So after they had the transition of our head coach, we did not do any Olympic lifting. Everything was jump training, ACL preventative in nature. We did not do a single barbell loaded movement in season. We did some in the off season, but once we got in season, it was all circuit-based training, uh, more functional, to, so to speak. Um, very heavily movement 
based and energy system development based. And um, we did not see nearly as many injuries as probably most people probably thought we would, given that we relinquished Olympic lifting and barbell loaded squats, deadlifts, trap bar deadlifts in season. Got it. Well, you're, you're not gonna get any grumbling from me. That's good. I would okay. be interested to see, to compare energy system development based teams versus those that may not be as inclined, like a basketball, soccer, where our bread and butter is on how we move, how well we move, how quickly we can move, rate of force development, how long we can last over the course of a game in terms of fitness levels um, versus a baseball or a softball where in that split second, you're trying to make contact and sprint, all gas, no brakes, home through first. Um, because obviously the sport demands, there's a, there's a bit of a difference. Um, but yeah, I think at the end of the day, you got to feed the need, right? Yeah. What have you, which sport have you learned the most from by doing programming for it? I think I've had the most experience with soccer and or basketball, but I also played soccer. So I think it's easier to see the other side when you've met a player yourself and it's easier to get buy-in from an athlete when you've played the same sport that they have. Um, baseball was a challenge for me coming in because I had an, I had previously had some softball experience, but not baseball experience, but I'll be honest. I think the team that challenged me the most from a programming standpoint here was golf. Um, I, I had never trained golf previously, nor do I think I could really hit a ball well without trying to muscle it, uh, off the driver. But, um, so I think golf was an interesting one for me, but again, I, I love the challenge of being able to figure out different sports and different athletes and putting them in the best position possible to be successful. So I'd say baseball and golf. You mentioned API or Athletes Performance Institute. Were, did you have an internship with them or did you work for them? I interned way back when in grad school. So like 2009, like? 2010. Mm -hmm. So core performance and athletes performance are actually like married. Yeah, um, so core performance, performance was more like corporate. The private sector. And, yes, yeah. the corporate. So that was my first. So originally, I thought I wanted to go private sector. I didn't think I wanted to be a college strength coach. Oh, no so kidding. core performance first to get a taste of the private sector, thinking, okay, well, I'll learn what I learned in grad school, but I'll use it in the private sector. Um, and I learned a great deal. The philosophies are very similar, just the approach and obviously the clientele is different, uh, but the way they approached what they did and how they did it was very much the same. Um, so I had a fantastic experience with core performance. And per the end of the, the internship, I asked, you know, if there's any ability for me to see the athlete side of things, I'd be very intrigued to do so. And so they were able to set me up with athletes performance in Arizona um, for a summer long internship from, from that lens and so forth. And that was interesting. I saw the whole combine, um, a lot of professional athletes, they also had a lot of high school athletes, and that's where probably we as interns got a great deal of our experience um, working with the high school athletes and observing more so with the professional athletes. But I found it interesting how the physical therapy side and the sports performance side were a pair and very much a tag team. They coincided with one another. You could see that the athletes would come in and, and, and get their treatments and so forth and prescriptions with the physical therapist and then transition over into the sports performance strength and conditioning side of things. But there was constant communication between sports performance coach and PT in terms of, okay, what are you seeing? I'm seeing this in training. What can we add? What should we subtract? And then tracking the athlete's progress week to week. Uh, yeah, now core performance headquarters and API in Arizona, they were side by side. But was there another core performance campus that you were in aside from that one? I was at uh, the one in Santa Monica. I see. That one's no longer here. Um, and now I think they're pretty much all over and more so like in Google and in corporate worlds. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I was in the Santa Monica core performance. And so what made you make that switch? Was it just how the PTs and sports performance were kind of dancing back and forth? you know, the switch, meaning your, your thought was working with general population, but you're, you're working with athletes. What, what said, you know what, I want to do that more. So core performance actually offered me a job at the end of my internship. 
And I called my advisor at Springfield College because I still had another half year or whatever, a year and a half left in the program to go. But at the time I didn't have a GA. So the first year was spent just sitting in labs in school and all the, the fun stuff, right? <laughs> and so I was, I was really torn because I wasn't sure if the experience at grad school was going to be different moving forward. Um, but I knew that I wanted to have the master's degree, especially as a black female entering this industry. So I called my advisor and I said, here's the deal. I've been offered an opportunity to stay at Core Performance. Um, obviously, I've completed a year. I'm, I'm not really sure what to do. And she said, funny how timing works. One of our graduate assistants has moved on. So with that, I'd like to consider you and offer you a GA. Mm -hmm. So I think you have a lot to think about. She said, I'm not going to choose one way or the other for you. Um, but I think you need to carefully consider both options. And certainly, you know, she told me, hey, don't forget, you're going to come, you could come back and get the rest of your, whatever's remaining in your education for free and get an opportunity to work with teams and program for teams and get additional practical experience to help bolster your resume before you move on. Or you can go take the job as is. And I mean, as soon as I hung up the phone, it was a no brainer. So I started this graduate degree. Yeah, I'm, I'm in a hole in terms of loans and whatnot, but the remainder for a year and a half is now going to be free and I'm going to be able to program and I'm going to have somebody advise me and give me feedback on my programming. So I'm going to have an opportunity to learn. It was, it was a no brainer for me. So I turned down the job, went back to Springfield College and I trained men's lacrosse, men's indoor volleyball, women's soccer, men's and women's tennis. And I'm glad I did because within the first week, I knew I made the right decision and I now loved being a college trained coach. So I was thankful that uh, what had happened happened and it was, it was pretty much the rest was history. There was no way I was going private sector now. In Springfield College, for those that don't know, I mean, they're, they're up there when it comes to strength conditioning, their whole department, their program, they've got some amazing professors who have been trained by like the the grandparents of the National Strength Conditioning Association. They did interns under Stone and Garhammer and so on, and they took it to Springfield College. So yeah, you were in a hotbed back there. What was, what was that like? How, how was it just learning at Springfield? It was fantastic. I mean, for me, I came in with a business degree. So I had a lot to learn. So literally for two and a half years, it was wake up before the sunrise, sun rises and go home well after the sun sets. So I just wanted to soak up every opportunity that I could. Granted, I had lifted for a long time. I had gone to strength and conditioning camp um, over the years throughout high school and college and played Division One soccer. But the approach was different, right? It's not, oh, I'm no longer training myself um, to play soccer, but now I have other athletes that I'm catering to. And I have coaches that are expecting a certain threshold of training for me. So there was a great deal of, of pressure and it was, it was incredibly competitive. You know, everybody at Springfield knows that they're amongst the Springfield mafia and what's considered the best of the best. And everybody's vying for GA positions. Everybody's vying for the next opportunity. Oftentimes we were interviewing against each other for jobs that would come our way or to the, the director's way. We'd say, hey, there's an opportunity here. I think, you know, these handful of people, whoever wants to put your name in, go for it. So at times, I think it could be a tense office. We're all sharing an office. Um, we're vying to get GAs and train our teams as best we can. And then also there were opportunities that were coming for career opportunities. And of course, you know, everybody wanted them, but it was still, it was still respectful, right? So everybody was still respectful, but we were still competitive at the same time. So I think it was a healthy competitiveness. So fast forward now to where you are and you've, You've gained so much knowledge and experience, but talk to anybody who knows a tremendous amount and they're the first one to say, I feel like I don't know nearly as much as I, I want to, because there's that thirst or hunger for more knowledge. The more we, we learn about the body and strength, conditioning, movements, rehab, wherever you want to put it. So where are your sights right now? Like leading off into this new year coming, where are you going for more information or is there this kind of area of of strength and conditioning or somewhere in those bubbles that that are tangential to them that you're going yeah i'm going to explore this more 
Well, um, we just had an in-service, FRC in-service. Um, so going the whole mobility, hails and rails route. So we're, we're constantly trying to add the latest, most innovative means necessary um, to set our athletes up for success. So that's kind of what we uh, did as a staff these last couple of weeks. So I think a number of us will be starting to look at implementing that more. So moving forward um, with our teams. In my world, I'll be honest. Um, and at times I think it comes with great frustration. I wear a lot of hats. I can honestly say I miss the ability to dive into literature as much as my staff gets the opportunity to uh, because of my role being in admin and overseeing two departments and training six teams and managing my people and so forth. So I hope to have more time in this coming sprint to lean on them. Um, I rely a lot on them and their research and, and learning new things. And it all boils down to being a lifelong learner and and getting out of the way of your own ego and saying, yeah, okay, maybe I've been in the industry for 11 years, but my responsibilities have changed a lot over the years, especially since I've taken on my role at LMU and it's to mentor them and develop them for the next opportunity. And in the meantime, allow them to coach their asses off 24 seven and pick their brains for what the latest and greatest is. Okay, this, this is one of those questions I vowed I'd never ask in a podcast. And I don't think I'm going to ask this exact same thing, but you just brought up there's, you want to do more reading. And with the time restrictions you have, you don't nearly get as much as your staff does. But are there a couple of books on your nightstand that you're, you're just chomping at the bit to get to? And what are those books? I, well, I've been diving into precision nutrition uh, certification. You like John's stuff? Yeah. You like it? Uh, yeah. I'm a big nutrition guru and buff, and I shouldn't say guru. I love nutrition. Honestly and truly, there's a part of me that probably, lo I love nutrition as much as strength training, if not more. And I think the two need to be married in order to reap the benefits and rewards of good strength training. And it's a hard sell with a college kid. Yeah. It's incredibly like How difficult. are you going to do that? Especially if you go to a dining common that is not married to that idea either, or they don't have like special plans for the athletes and how, where's the buy-in with that? How, how are you going to do that? I think little by little. So I oversee our fueling station here. Um, uh -huh. So educating, we've been educating and presenting to our athletes this past semester, providing them with knowledge in terms of what does pre-practice nutrition look like versus post-practice nutrition and how important that window of opportunity is, that meal and pre-practice primer, post-practice primer, and post-practice or competition meal, and that the bulk of your nutrition and your solid nutrition, good nutrition, needs to be in that world in order to reap the benefits of what you do in there. Because you and I know that more often than not, most college thing, kids think that they grow in the weight room. And that yeah. couldn't be further from the truth, right? Everybody is, oh, I'm getting a pump. And so I'm growing because I'm seeing my muscles get bigger. But the reality of the matter is you're tearing your muscle fibers, right? With every single rep that you take. So you're actually depleting yourself and breaking yourself down. So unless you actually fuel properly, you're not going to reap the rewards of this training session or the phase to come. In fact, we're going to have some serious issues. So educating them, okay, here's what it looks like and what it should feel like when you fuel properly. And here are some red flag signs of when you aren't fueling properly, right? Are you recovering as well? Are you sleeping eight to 10 hours? Are you sleeping eight hours through the night? We have hydration challenges, the avoid yellow urine. Are you hydrated throughout the day? Um, are you able to train and lift like on a baseball team and have a heavy lift and then go to a two and a half hour practice and not be dead, right? So I think just educating them as far as reaping the rewards and seeing the gains that they say that they want. And once they start seeing the positive gains, then the buy-in is there. And it, 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 it's small, right? You can't expect a college kid to go through their cupboards, throw out all their trash, go to the grocery store with the grocery list that you provide them and to buy organic lean meats, vegetables, complex carbohydrates, and not live a little, right? No, but if you've got pre and post training fueling stations at their at their disposal i mean that's that's huge game changer and we'd yeah. like to be able to provide them more but 
I, in, in some respects, it helps that it's smaller. So we have educational signage up that says, okay, here's, here's your checklist for your pre-practice primers. You want fast acting carbohydrates, moderate protein, low in fat and fiber so that we're not slowing down in the digestion rate. And here's your best five options. Choose one, right? Here's the same thing and the benefits in your checklist for post-practice. Choose one. I can tell you right now, chocolate milk is our hottest, is our hottest item. Sure. Um, and then here's some snack items, okay? Some grab and go options for those of you that have classes all day and you don't have a ton of time, okay? High protein, jerky, bars, so on and so forth. Healthy nut options, healthy fat options, almonds, cashews, and the likes. So they're, <laughs> they've, they've bought into it, surely but surely. What about the coaching staff? Oh, the coaching staff is, is all in for it. Any, any, oh yeah. I've had all of my coaches have come to me individually now asking, okay, what should we be doing on the road? So now the kids nice. are saying, hey, well, we're eating healthy after training and we're educated to eat this way in strength and conditioning. Well, shouldn't we be following similar guidelines when we go on the road and not having fast food? So Excellent. I've had coaches come down and sit with me and say, okay, what, what are the guidelines? And I'm like, fast food is off the table. Definitely pre-competition. Now, maybe you want to entice a team and say, hey, if we go 2-0 and on the weekend, okay, maybe we'll have a victory in and out. Fantastic. But for a pre-competition, absolutely not sodas can't have them right all the sugary drinks can't have them so giving them a checklist of complex carbs lean proteins fruits veggies um and then crossing off certain items like for me with women's basketball i didn't like to hear it alfredo sauce can't have it you can have pasta and marinara sauce but we're not we're not going with heavy alfredo sauce the night before a game all things fried are off the table sweet teas and sodas are off the table you can have water nice well and then you get the star players to buy in with that and everyone else follows too, I imagine. Yes. Nice. Sometimes you get the star player that doesn't want to follow through and they're still a star player. So that's always the fun part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those, those would be the little check marks next to things that could improve. Coach, this has been awesome. I really appreciate the time you put aside for me and we could chat like this. And uh, I, LMU is... I don't get a sense that this is going to be the, the, the last stop on your ride here. Do you, uh, and not to get you into any kind of trouble <laughs> with anybody in LMU, but you've been there three and a half years. You're with the Sparks for six. Well, are there some aspirations that you're, you're looking toward? Perhaps uh, a director at the power five level has always been an aspiration. Um, I'd be lying if I said that at one point in time in my, my life and my career that I didn't have hopes of the NFL. Um, that was kind of the driving force when I got, all, when I got into this. Um, but I guess time, time will tell. I'm happy right now. And I think if there's anything I've learned along the way, it's not to rush the process, but instead trust the process. And whatever is meant to be will be. But I have a great situation right now at LMU. I'm stoked to... Uh, be working alongside with with three guys that uh we all get along and have a great working and personal relationship so i'm not rushing anything but i also can't say that i wouldn't welcome the right opportunity if the right opportunity came well that sounds like your life story right there so uh, well, yeah why stop now it's worked well so far oh this has been truly wonderful so uh do you have an instagram page that you want to throw out there yes. or any kind of IG connection? IG handles are K Dormandy, D O R M A N D Y. And for anybody interested in following along with LMU Sports Performance, I believe it is LMU Lions underscore sports performance. And you can flip back and find 184 TSODs, training sessions of the day from COVID. We did 184 straight days of promoting body weight workouts for those for those that are stuck at home oh that's nice maybe i'll create a challenge just to myself maybe 90 90 of those in 90 days or something that could be good oh, there you go i love that i like that all right coach has been fantastic again thank you for your time thank you for having me and that's a wrap for another episode of the zealous podcast uh, be sure you subscribe i mean it's been a while you've been listening to a few you might as well just click that button and because every week you're going to get a new episode next week's no exception we'll see you then